Good morning. The uh, meeting will come to order. I'm Rodney Freelingheisen, Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, and I know I join uh, Chairman Shelby in welcoming everybody here to this conference uh, this morning and, and for your time and energy that's gone into this bill package. I know that Chairman Shelby, Ranking Member Leahy, and Ranking Member Lowy share my commitment to regular order, and I want to thank them for their partnership as we continue this process. We're, we are considering three items this morning, the Defense Appropriations Bill for Fiscal Year 2019, the Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Appropriations Bill for Fiscal Year 2019, and the continuing resolution. In front of each of you is the full set of conference notes for each of the two bills, noting the matters in disagreement between the two bodies. We have reached resolution on all items and completed our work on these bills. The dispositions of each, of each item are annotated in the notes before you, as well as the annotated bill text in the side-by-side -side comparison. The one additional matter for consideration by conferees is the continuing resolution. A section-by-section -section summary of the CR is before you. It is merely a continuation of current levels with a few minor technical adjustments. The CR duration is through December 7th of this year, allowing us to complete our work on the remaining bills as we intend to do. Earlier this week, the House filed the first minibus conference report for the 2019 fiscal year, which I expect the House to pass this afternoon, and as we know, the Senate passed last night. We continue the, that forward momentum today as we meet on the fiscal year 2019 Department of Defense Labor HHS Services Bill Appropriations Bills. This is a necessary first step towards completing all of our appropriations bills as soon as possible before the end of the fiscal year in just over two weeks. And I'll note this is the first time we've conferenced the Department of Defense bill since the 2007 fiscal year. This is a tremendous step forward on our goal of returning to regular order. I want to thank all of you for your commitment to this process and to this institution. Providing for our national defense is Congress's most important responsibility, but it is especially critical now. Our armed forces have been weakened by years of declining and unstable budgets, it's time that we provide the military, the greatest military in the world, with the resources they need to rebuild. Both the House and Senate bills laid strong groundwork for this, and through our negotiations, we provide for our troops equipment and training that keeps our nation safe, that assures that their families are cared for. In addition to funding for the Department of Defense, it is also necessary that we fund critical domestic priorities. The Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Appropriations Bills supports programs that protect the health, education, and labor standards that all Americans deserve. Again, I want to thank the members of the conference committee, particularly Chairman, Chairwoman Granger, Ranking Member Visklowski, Chairman Cole, Ranking Member DeLauro, and their counterparts, along with our hardworking staff for their extraordinary efforts that brought us to the table today. I look forward to continue this progress with the conference with a conference meeting for our third minibus later this afternoon. As was done with previous conference meetings, we'll take turns making opening remarks, chair to chair, ranking member to ranking member. My pleasure to first turn to the Senate Full Appropriations Committee and the Defense Subcommittee Chairman, Mr. Shelby, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be back at the table with you again. Uh, just a week ago, uh, we met uh, here with an agreement uh, on the first minibus at our fingertips. Following that meeting, we kept working and hammering out a compromise soon thereafter. Yesterday, as everyone knows, the full Senate passed that conference report by a vote of 92 to 5. By this afternoon, I expect it will have passed the House, hope so, and uh, be on its way to the President's desk for his signature. Given the dysfunction of the appropriations process in recent years, getting three bills signed into law on time would itself mark meaningful progress. But we're poised to do much, much more. The defense and labor HHS bills account for the lion's share of discretionary spending, as just about everybody here knows. Pairing these two bills together was the linchpin of our strategy to pass appropriation bills in the Senate. 
One, the top priority of the Republicans. The other, the top priority of the Democrats. Both important to all Americans. Combining the two provides the opportunity, I believe, for all of us to make progress together. And I'm pleased to say here today that last night we were able to resolve our remaining differences on this package by following the framework that led to success uh, on the first. I want to thank, take a second here again and do some thank yous too. I want to thank Vice, Vice Chairman uh, of the Defense Subcommittee, Senator Durbin, and our House counterparts, Chairwoman Granger and Ranking Member Wisconsin, for working with us to ensure that our military has the resources it needs to maintain readiness and also to modernize. I also want to take a few seconds to recognize Chairman Blunt and Cole and uh, <coughs> Uh, ranking members Murray and Delario for their great work, the Labor HHS Division, in, in the package. Uh, Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Senator Leahy, uh, Congressman Loy, we're making real progress here, but we've got to keep going. If we continue to set aside the things that divide us and focus on what we can do together, I think we're going to continue to get across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Shelby. It's my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Ms. Lowy, for any remarks or statement she may wish to make. Ms. Lowy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Defense and Labor HHS education bills include some of Congress's most important constitutional responsibilities, and I'm pleased that we have made so much progress on these bills. The conference agreement will provide ample resources for our armed services, robust funding for life-saving medical research at the National Institutes of Health, and support for vital health care initiatives like Title X family planning and teen pregnancy prevention. I'm also proud that we have removed all of the unnecessary and deeply partisan riders. While it is regrettable that a continuing resolution is necessary, I'm pleased that we will have conference agreements on these two important bills. We will also have a conference meeting later today on four additional bills, and I have high hopes for their completion as well. I thank our members and our staff for their hard work to get us to this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Uh, my pleasure to recognize the Senate Appropriations Vice Chair, Senator Leahy, for any remarks or statement. Well, thank Senator. you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, feels like old times is actually back here doing uh, conferences. I'm glad to be here at the second appropriations conference of the fiscal year. The two bills uh, before us, the Defense Appropriations Bill and the Labor HHS and Education Bill, are the product of months of hard work and bipartisan cooperation. I'm glad we've been able to work out differences between the two bodies. Not only does a lot for the security of our country, but also uh, national defense security, but also the the uh, uh, the future of our country. They demonstrate the importance of the bipartisan budget agreement reached earlier this year. And they've kept out uh, uh, riders that, in some cases, Republicans might want, other cases, Democrats might want, but instead kept those out and kept to the appropriations bills. And then the priorities outlined uh, made to real policy to improve the lives of America. Take the Labor HHS education bill. New investments, health care and education. Increased funding for the National Institutes of Health. We invest in working families, improving access to child care, promoting college affordability. And instead of just talking about the opioid epidemic, we actually put money in there. The defense bill provides critical resources to support our men and women in uniform, their families. Now, we did our job. We focused on the task at hand. Not everything that Chairman Shelby might want, not everything <coughs> I might want, are in here. But those of us who have actually, in our experience in this or other committees, have known if you get most of what you want, it's better than getting nothing of what you want. So, um, Chairman Shelby, made a commitment to a bipartisan process. He's kept his word. He knows I've kept mine, so I appreciate that. I also thank Senators Blunt and Murray and Durbin, because if they hadn't worked so hard, it wouldn't have happened. And the House chairs and ranking members, Representative Granger, 
Viskoski, Representatives Cole and De, uh, DeLauro. We also have in here a, a continuing resolution uh, through December, early December. It keeps the government open while we complete negotiations on the remaining bills. We set a track record of such negotiations. So I hope we can get this done, get this done soon. I think the uh, plan, uh, Mr. Chairman, is to get this finished. We vote on it next week in the, <coughs> in the Senate. I'd like to get on the President's desk as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. It's my pleasure to recognize the House Defense Subcommittee Chair, Ms. Granger, for her remarks. Thank you, Chairman Friedenheisen. I'm proud to present the fiscal year 2019 Defense Appropriation Agreement to the Conference Committee. Secretary Mattis, General Dunford, and the rest of the Joint Chiefs have asked Congress to provide them with sufficient, stable, and timely funding. This agreement gives them what they asked for, including that last and most critical part uh, of timely funding. Fiscal year 20, 2009 was the last year that DOD did not have to operate under a continuing resolution. We can all be proud to say that the cycle of continuing resolutions stops here and it stops today. This agreement provides critically needed funding for readiness, equipment, and research, which allows Secretary Mattis and the Chiefs to continue to rebuild our military and meet the diverse threats to our national security. It reflects the priorities of our military and the priorities and concerns of our colleagues in both the House and the Senate. This is a bicameral and bipartisan product. I want to thank my partner, Pete Visklosky. I couldn't do it with a better uh, uh, partner, and Senator Shelby and Durbin for their dedication to work with the House and advance this important legislation. This is the last defense conference for my friend and full committee chairman, Rodney Freelingheisen. Without your leadership, we would not be here today presenting this package. Rodney, you've been a tireless advocate for our military, and the subcommittee will miss you tremendously. I also want to commend uh, Senator Shelby and Senator Leahy for their leadership and success in returning the Senate to regular order on appropriation bills. Further, I want to thank all of the members of our defense subcommittee for their hard work and invaluable contributions to this bill. And finally, I want to thank the staff for all their long hours of effort to bring this agreement together. I urge adoption of this agreement, and I yield back. And thank you, Ms. Granger. My pleasure to recognize uh, Mr. Viscossi, the House Defense Subcommittee ranking member, for any remarks he may wish to make. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I simply want to profoundly thank uh, yourself, uh, Chairman Shelby, uh, the ranking members, Ms. Lowy and uh, Senator Leahy, uh, as well as uh, my uh, chairwoman, uh, Chairwoman Granger, uh, Senator Durbin, uh, for bringing us together today. Uh, my recollection is the last time I participated in an active conference for defense appropriations was in this room, and President Bush was in office. What I find most heartening in today's meeting is the commitment, I believe, uh, the chairman, uh, Mr. Freelingheisen, and Senator Shelby have, as well as their partners, their ranking members, to make sure this is not an anomaly and this is the first step to permanency in this process. Relative to the Department of Defense, I would note that in the past, the lack of predictable appropriations has been a major obstacle to the planning and execution of programs, military readiness, and morale. Having timely appropriations should improve and stabilize budgeting by the department and services, our allies and contractors. I expect that this stability and certainty will allow the Department of Defense to better adhere to congressional direction, spend the funding as appropriated, increase transparency for budget exhibits, and improve the quality and timeliness of communication. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Viscoss. It's my pleasure to recognize the Senate Defense Subcommittee Ranking Member, Mr. Durbin, Senator Durbin, for any remarks he may wish to make. Thank you very much, Chair Chairman. Uh, Chairman Shelby, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to especially thank Congressman Granger and Congressman Viscoski uh, for the successful conference on the defense bill. It is the largest spending bill that comes before us, uh, and we worked out a bipartisan approach to it. Uh, which I think is fair to all sides, and I thank my colleagues on both sides of the table. We took the highlights of the Senate bill, a major investment in innovation, and the best parts of the House bill, a focus on modernizing military equipment, 
and we made it work. This bill contains a lot of money, just shy of $674 billion. Secretary Mattis will have his hands full making sure that these funds are spent wisely and not wasted, but I trust him. He's right now dealing with the first full audit of the Department of Defense, which will be made public in just two months. This is a step forward for accountability, and I'm prepared to hear good news and bad news. But the bill before us takes steps to cut wasteful spending before the audit's complete. We are sending $3.8 billion in funds the DOD asked for last year, but now can't be spent. Rather than leaving the funds in place for who knows what purpose, we're using them to support the unmet needs of the women, men, and families of the armed forces. Again, I'd like to see this appropriations process get back to the reg on track with regular order, and I want to thank my colleagues, Senator Shelby and Leahy, for their commitment to that as well. This is the first conference on defense and labor age bills since 2007. I'm so pleased at the continued strong funding. I want to thank Sec uh, Senator Blunt as well as Senator Marie, who is not here at this time, but I want her on the record to know their continued strong funding increases for the National Institutes of Health, I think, are setting a standard which we'll be proud of for generations to come. And while he's here, Congressman Cole, thank you for your cooperation uh, in making this happen, along with Congresswoman DeLauro. Um, the efforts that you've made on the CDC, our efforts on NIH are very complimentary, and I thank you so much for your, your commitment. I'm glad there's a continued investment in open textbooks pilot to save students money. We hear about it all the time, kids getting out of college deep in debt. Don't overlook what hap what's happening at the bookstores. We can find ways to reduce the cost of textbooks for students and therefore make college more affordable. We've got a long way to go before all the appropriation bills are signed into law, but we've shown good bipartisan cooperation so far. Let me say there's one other issue I want to raise. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to offer an amendment here today, amendment number one at the desk. It's a bipartisan amendment. It's for a measure that already passed the Senate by unanimous consent. Chuck Grassley and I put together this measure. It simply provides $1 million for the Department of Health and Human Services to require price tags on direct-to-consumer drug advertising. It is not a Democratic poison pill writer. Try to find a Democratic poison pill writer that has the support of Chuck Grassley, or for that matter, has the support of the President of the United States. I don't often quote the President's tweets, but I'm going to at this moment. Here's what President Donald Trump said about our bipartisan amendment. Great to see the Senate working on solutions to end secrecy around ridiculously high drug prices. Something I called for in my drug pricing blueprint, the President says. We will now work with the House to help American patients. Secretary Azar has contacted each and every one of you. He really is committed to this, as is the President. How can this be a Democratic poison pill rider? How could we have the support not only of the President and HH Secretary Azar, AARP, American Medical Association, American Hospital Association, American Health Insurance Plans, 76% of the American people and the entire United States Senate. It's supported by the chair and ranking members of the House Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee, Republican Chairman Burgess, Democratic ranking member Green. For some reason, someone on the other side is trying to block this common sense truly bipartisan policy to lower drug costs for America's patients. When are we going to stand up to Big Pharma and actually do something about sky-high prescription drug prices? President Trump thinks this is a moment. Will we join together today on a bipartisan basis to say that it will? Transparency in advertising is the very least Congress can do. Let's put patients before pharma. And I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting a truly bipartisan amendment. I'm going to ask for a roll call vote at the appropriate time. Uh, thank you, Senator Durbin. It's my pleasure to recognize the House Labor, Health, and Human Services Subcommittee, uh, Mr. Cole of Oklahoma, for any remarks he may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'd like to begin by thanking my colleagues and the staff for all the hard work that brought us to this moment. Uh, I simply couldn't have a better working partner than my friend from Connecticut, Ms. Delora. And uh, it's, uh, I always joke I've been doing what Roy Blunt told me to do ever since I got to Congress anyway, so nothing has changed very much. Uh, but to have the opportunity to work with my good friend Senator Blunt and my good friend Senator Murray as well has been a delight. And uh, let's not forget again the staff, which I think has just done an exceptional job on both sides of the aisle and both sides of the rotunda to help us clear out uh, some of the knotty issues. Today marks a, a victory uh, and a return to regular order 
for the Labor, Health and Human Services Appropriations Bill. And I want to take a moment here to thank my chairman, uh, who uh, frankly has done a great job, and my, uh, his counterpart, uh, Senator Shelby, and obviously their partner, Senator Leahy, and uh, Congresswoman uh, Nita Lowy for the job that they've done in setting a framework that allows us to actually arrive at a consensus on what's historically a challenging bill for the two parties to work together on. Um, I'm proud to, again, to be here at this conference meeting today and proud of the product that the conference has produced. The agreement boosts funding for the National Institutes of Health by $2 billion, continuing our quest to cure diseases and genetic conditions like Alzheimer's disease, cancer, and Down syndrome. We've provided increases to help our nation prepare for public health emergencies and to fight and end the opioid abuse epidemic. I'm also proud to say that the agreement includes $50 million for a new infectious disease rapid reserve fund, uh, response fund. Uh, this fund will not only save Americans money, it will save lives. By banking resources now that can only be used in the event of a future infectious disease public health emergency, will provide the Secretary of Health and Human Services with immediate access to funds uh, to respond to new uh, outbreaks uh, without waiting months for Congress to pass a costly supplemental bill. The conference uh, agreement also includes increased funding for education and training programs, including a $70 million increase for career and technical education and a $60 million increase for TRIO and Gear Up programs to help more students obtain solid workplace skills in the career of their choosing. Uh, we have increased programs to help people with disabilities live independently and to help fund early in, uh, intervention and education services for children with disabilities. We've increased funding for school safety and mental health programs and increased funding for graduate and medical education to help train more primary health providers in areas our country needs uh, the most. This is a good agreement. I want to thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for their diligence in bringing it to the finish line on time for the first time in 22 years. And I look forward to the floor passage on both in both bodies and the president's signature. Signature. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Cole. My pleasure to recognize the Senate Labor HHS Subcommittee Chairman Senator Blunt for any remarks or statement he may wish to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the first conference committee I was in in the Congress was about 22 years ago, and you were in the room. Uh, and I'm glad you're in the room again. Thanks for your leadership on this committee and all the service you provided to the Congress. Grateful to you and, and Congresswoman Lowy, along with our chairman and ranking member over here for really the extraordinary work you all have done to get us to this point. Uh, certainly, uh, Tom Cole and I have enjoyed working together on this with uh, Rosa DeLora and with Patty Murray. Uh, this is, as, as uh, Chairman Cole said, this will be the first time in 22 years this bill would be signed into law before September uh, the uh, 30th. Uh, and um, I'll knock on wood one more time, as I have every time I've suggested we're about to get things done here. We're so out of practice and so grateful to see this happen. When we took this bill to the Senate floor, when the Chairman Shelby decided we'd put these two bills together, it was the first time that uh, the Labor H bill had been on the Senate floor in 11 years. Uh, so the first time in 11 years, uh, every senator had a chance to debate this bill. Uh, our subcommittee received 6,164 requests from senators as to what should be in this bill, uh, and we had 31 amendments uh, negotiated on the floor that uh, would have been part of a manager's package that I was glad to, glad to see come together. You know, this does the things that Chairman Cole says it does. We fight the opioid epidemic, we expand medical research, promote college affordability, and completion, uh, and we strengthen America's workforce. This bill um, goes a long way toward uh, moving in the right direction again on NIH research, widely supported by members on both sides of uh, the, the Congress and on both sides of the aisle on the Senate side. Uh, in addition to the $2 billion increase in NIH, which will put us at a 30% increase over four years, uh, we reach in this bill a goal that's been out there for quite a while to get our Alzheimer's research uh, at a $2 billion annual level. This bill moves it to $2.34 billion. And this is uh, in an area where 
uh, taxpayers are spending about $270 billion every year for Alzheimer's and dementia-related care. Uh, we're still at 1% of trying to find a solution to a problem that is one of the biggest growing cost problems in the federal government, but we are a lot closer than we were uh, not too long ago. Uh, research uh, in health it's, comes at such a critically important time, what we know about the human genome, the break, breakthroughs we've seen in immunotherapy, what may happen with CRISPR technology. Uh, this is something that the federal government should be encouraging and with this bill uh, continues to encourage. $3.8 billion toward targeted opioid funding represents the fourth year in a row we've increased that funding by a total of 1,300 percent over the last four years, and uh, everybody has lots of familiarity with why we need to be engaged in that at every level we can be. We're doing our best to try to prepare people for school, keep them in school. We, uh, for the second year in a row, we're turning this bill to year-round Pell, and the very best way to keep your college uh, costs low is to finish. Nothing gets you done quicker than pursuing a pattern that's working. That's what the return to year-round Pell lets, lets us do. And uh, almost every school in America that had the school this summer had a lot more students than they had in higher education the year before that. So again, I'll submit the rest of my comments for the record. It's uh, really a great uh, privilege to see the leadership of the committee chairman and ranking member on both sides, and particularly for me, uh, to get to work with Congresswoman Delora and uh, Senator Murray, uh, as well as, as Tom Cole. And uh, we've made this a joint effort, and hopefully we're going to all be proud of our joint results. Uh, thank you, Senator Blunt. It's my pleasure to recognize the House Labor HHS ranking member, Ms. Delora of Connecticut, for any comments or remarks she may wish to make. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, am so delighted to be here. as. Uh, been many, many years since uh, uh, we have reached this point. But I also want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues and the, um, on the uh, uh, House and Senate and Labor HHS and the, and the great working relationship that we do have with uh, Chairman Cole and uh, uh, Senator Blunt, uh, Senator Murray. Uh, and I want to say thank you to you, Chairman Frelingheiser, and uh, to our ranking member, Mrs. Lowy. Uh, for all of your efforts, and to my colleagues again, um, with uh, Senator Shelby, uh, Senator Leahy, Senator Durbin, it is great to be here uh, with all of you uh, t today. Uh, at this point, I think um, this is an important step, a very, very important step to get the 2019 bill completed. And I, too, would like to name some of the critical increases, which I think are appropriate. And they include an increase of $2 billion for NIH research, an increase of $200 million for Head Start, including $50 million for Early Head Start, an increase of $50 million for the Child Care and Development Block Grant, an increase for after-school programs and the Maximum Pell Grant, and increases across the Center for Disease Control and, and Prevention and the Health Resources and Services Administration with particular uh, focus on addressing the health threats to pregnant women and to babies. I am very pleased to say that the bill eliminates two long-standing prohibitions on using education funding for transportation to address increasingly racially segregated schools. And meanwhile, this bill takes action against the President's manufactured crisis at the border. The family separation crisis is child abuse, and according to reports, more than 400 children are still in custody at HHS. Many parents may have been deported. They may never be reunited. But this bill maintains the bipartisan amendments that House Democrats in introduced to condemn this policy, to demand a reunification plan, and ensure the administration upholds the highest standards of care and privacy. We will continue to pursue the cost estimates as well as the costs related to unaccompanied children and reunification. And we will also continue to, to look at and concern ourselves with and be vigilant as to where the dollars are coming from and what, from what programs these dollars are coming from. Um, all of that said, I am disappointed that we could not reach an agreement on guns uh, for teachers uh, and not arming teachers, uh, which was not a rider. 
Um, we missed an opportunity, in my view, to say once and for all that ESSA's authors never intended for federal dollars to arm teachers, which, as I understand it, is current law. So we will continue to raise the issue until the uh, Department of Education and Secretary DeVos uphold what was the will of the Congress. Finally, I'm delighted that the bill is free from harmful riders, does not overturn the Flores Settlement or sabotage the Affordable Health Care Act or undermine women's health funding. Um, not a perfect bill, but I congratulate my colleagues on reaching a bipartisan compromise. The President will have to sign it into law. Um, or shut down the government since it contains the continuing resolution. I support this bill, and I look forward to seeing it enacted on time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Okay, thank you, Ms. Uh, DeLauro. Uh, does any member uh, seek uh, recognition? Uh, Senator <laughs> Durbin uh, has indicated uh, his desire to, and, and you're, you're so recognized. I, I would like to call my amendment. Okay. Uh, Members offered his amendment. Uh, is there is there any? But we don't have we don't have a copy of the amendment. So, So everybody has a copy. Okay. Is there any uh, the members have any comment on the on the on the uh, on, on the uh, amendment? Mr. Chairman? Uh, Chairman Shelby. Uh, is it in order now for uh, Senator Durbin to be recognized? Uh, yes. I thank Chairman Shelby. I've made my speech. I don't need to make it again. I offer the amendment. Uh, any uh, further comments? Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Adderholt. Yes. Uh, I think somebody's you. trying to get me, and I don't want them, though. Uh, Y'all all understand. It might have to do with uh, something here. Uh, I understand this is an issue that uh, Senator uh, Durbin's uh, really involved in, he's passionate about, and it, it makes some sense. Uh, but we've negotiated a, a, an agreement on this package. The Senator's amendment wasn't included in the package because it, it, to many of the, our friends across the table here, uh, it was controversial, it was a poison pill. And so I, I would hope that we would not blow this thing up, that we've come so close. Uh, this might come about someday, but I hope not on today's bill. I'd, I'd hope to vote no on this. Senator Leahy? Uh, Senator Leahy is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, one, the, the amendment is an excellent amendment. It, uh, the fact that uh, Senator Durbin and Senator Grassley joined together on this passed the uh, U.S. Senate unanimously uh, speaks to how well worthwhile it is. People ought to know how much drugs that are being advertised are going to cost. And in a normal authorization bill, I would eagerly and strongly support it, as I did on the floor. But it is, um, uh, I have to join with Senator Shelby that we have kept our agreement. Senator Shelby's had to give up some things that he wanted in this bill, just as I've had to give up some things I wanted. One of the things I would have very much wanted would be from our uh, Democratic leader, Senator Durbin. And I know that Chairman Grassley uh, Chairman of the Judiciary Committee wanted it, but it did not make it through the negotiation agreement, so I will not support it. Uh, any further comments? Uh, uh, is the Senate prepared to vote on its? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are prepared to vote, I'm sure, but let me say I've worked with Senator uh, 
Durbin on so many issues on this bill, and in fact, I understand why he wants to offer this amendment. I accepted this amendment as part of the uh, manager's amendment on the floor and tried to we tried, we argue that it should be in the bill, uh, but uh, our friends in the House felt differently on this topic. Uh, it's the first time in 22 years this bill has gotten to this point this quickly. There's a lot <coughs> in the bill. I will be voting no, but with uh, some, the same reluctance that uh, the chairman and the senator played uh, shared on this. Senator Durbin. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me say I think this is a critically important bill, an amendment. One million dollars by federal standards is usually what falls off the edge of the table and nobody notices. But in this case, it was more than that. It's the reason why President Trump and Secretary Azar support it. They want the Food and Drug Administration to take a step forward. The average American sees nine drug ads a day on television, nine every single day. The single most heavily advertised drug in America today is Humira. Humira was designed for rheumatoid arthritis. It's now being advertised for psoriasis, the little red patch in my elbow. How much does Humira cost? $5,500 a month. $5,500 a month. Despite all the disclosures on the Humira ad about every imaginable bad effect that might occur if you use this drug, they never mention the price. Many consumers never know the price. Their insurance companies do, and ultimately they're reflected in the premiums Americans are paying. It isn't until you get to the cash register sometimes that people finally figure out how much this costs. How much is this Zarelto blood thinner? Oh, it turns out it's $500 a month, and there are much cheaper versions that can do the same thing. So you ask the health insurance companies across America today, what's the number one driver of increased health insurance premiums, the cost of prescription drugs. The cost of prescription drugs, the number one driver. Blue Cross Blue Shield in Illinois tells me they spend more money on prescription drugs each year than they spend on inpatient hospital care. Think about that for a second. All I'm asking is for transparency. Chuck Grassley is not a big government man, you know that. But he joined me because he believes transparency is the only fair thing we can give to the American consumers. That's what this is all about. And we ended up with a unanimous consent coming out of the Senate. Democrats and Republicans agreed on this. It's so basic. And then to have the president not only support it with his tweet, but to send his Secretary of Health and Human Services to spend full time reaching out to each one of you to try to get to the point where we at least disclose this to American consumers. I could never be in this position today were it not for my colleagues sitting at this table. Each one of them is truly, beyond a colleague, a dear friend, and each one has done something that I've been proud to be associated with in the bills that are before us here. Sec uh, Senator Blunt, my friend from Missouri, for four straight years, more than 5% real growth in the National Institutes of Health, thanks to the cooperation of the House members. Senator Shelby, my friend from the House back in the day, uh, who has really restored integrity back to the appropriations process in a very short period of time. And my friend Pat Leahy, he and I have been through so many battles together, I can't recount them. And if they tell me that they have given their word now and are duty-bound to stand by it and were prepared to vote against a measure which they helped me bring to this point, I do not want to put them in that spot. I know they're with me on that. I know that ultimately we will find a way to prevail, but I beg you, Please put consumers across this country ahead of pharma when it comes to this critical issue. I withdraw my amendment. Thank you, Senator. Uh, before we wrap up, Shelman, uh, Chairman Shelby or Ranking Member Lowy or Vice Chairman Lee, any closing remarks or can we uh, shut it down? Oh, I, think we've come, I think we've come a long way, Mr. Chairman, and I'd, I'd like to finish the job, and I know you would okay. too. Uh, hearing none, uh, we appreciate everyone being here today to complete our work on these matters. Uh, given that no amendments were adopted, nor have any additional matters been brought to the table for consideration agreed upon, the Defense and Labor HHS bills and the continuing resolution are adopted as annotated in the papers before you. Uh, so the uh, conference is concluded, and I thank you all for your uh, participation, and uh, we stand adjourned.